Welcome to The Art of Living Proactively. My guest today, episode 227, is Mark Wingfield. And in today's episode, we talk about havening. What is the havening technique? We talk about Six Sigma and self-defense. And Mark discusses his experience with Six Sigma, what that is, the set of techniques and tools that it involves. We talk about the impact of trauma. And that conversation delves into the impact of trauma, how it affects people's lives. And Mark really emphasizes the importance of being proactive about health and well-being. There's some personal stories Mark tells and a lot more. So that's in today's episode, episode 227 with Mark Wingfield. And remember that all episodes are now on YouTube. The actual videos are on YouTube. In the past, all of the episodes were audio only. We now have a video option, which is on YouTube, and the normal audio option is available on all podcast platforms. Transcripts are available on the website at www.tonywinyrd.com. Welcome to another edition of The Art of Living Proactively. Uh, my guest today is Mark Wingfield. How are you, Mark? I'm very well, thanks, Tony. Good to be here. Good to be here again. And so again, uh, yes, thank, you, thank you kindly for, because we actually did record this a few months ago when the new series was then at the time it was going to be called circle it was with escape of the vicious circle yeah. that was what the series was going to be called and then i decided not to go with that and go on with the art of living proactively and mark has very kindly come back and we're recording a whole episode again so thank you very much mark that's all right no problem so how because you're in in the uk where are you mark i'm in derbyshire so just just south of derby so slapping right. in the middle of, of england so more or less in the middle of the UK as well, but so, yeah, in the middle, in the Midlands. Okay. So if I was to ask you, who are you? How would you answer that? Oh, who am I? I'm an eclectic mix of what I've, what I've done over the years, really. I'm not your average mix of skills and makeup, really. I'm reasonably good at most things. I'm terrible at anything practical, but apart from that, I'm reasonably good at most things. things and so it really did what i've done over my life has really been dictated by my interests so who am i i guess we all try and find ourselves when we're teenagers don't we and mm -hmm. when i was a teenager i had no idea what i wanted to do all i knew is that i wanted to experience as much of life as i could and that was my starting point so when i was deciding about what I was going to do, further education or whatever at the age of 18. I thought, I don't really know what I want to do. Both my brothers have gone to university and they've had a great time and they seem to have learned lots out of it. So I think I'll do that, but I'm not really sure what I want to do. So I took a business studies degree, partly because I had to. Um, my results weren't brilliant at A level, it must be said, because I didn't work very hard. And I didn't get where I wanted to go by one point in our academic system. Okay. But I phoned them up and I said, look, this is my, this is what I've got. And to some my surprise, the admissions tutor said, oh, you interviewed really well. And uh, we know you got great results at, when you were 16. So we know you're capable of doing stuff. You can come on the course. I was like, oh, fantastic. But you have to take the German option. I'm like, that's all right. I don't mind that. That was part of the attraction of the course. But they had this not very well utilized German option where if you chose that stream, you had to, first of all, work in Germany on an industrial placement. And you also had to study there for three months as well. I was like, oh, that's all right. Yeah, that's fine. So we agreed that I was coming. And anyway, so because of that, 
that has steered a lot of my later adult life. Okay. So because I lived in Germany, my ge- I did German A-level up to the age of 18. I was okay, but I certainly wasn't fluent. Yeah. And I really got through my A-level. I scraped through my A-level because of my German literature. Right. Not because I was any good at speaking it or my grammar. But when I arrived in Germany, within three months, I was fluent. Right. Because I was speaking at the yeah. time. Yeah. And so who am I? That has a part in my history because when I, I did various jobs, but at one point I was made redundant and I had an outplacement consultant. This guy said, okay, what do you want to do as the next job? I'm like, I don't know. And he said, what are you good at? I said, I'm okay at sales. I like traveling. And he said, what skills you got? I said, well, I'm pretty much broad range of skills. I wouldn't say I'm brilliant at anything in particular, but I'm quite good at a lot of things. And he said, okay, what skills you got? I, said, I speak. I used to speak German really well. I was really fluent. And he said, well, okay, so you like traveling, but you're okay at sales and you speak German. Why aren't you in export sales then? Ooh. Ding. <laughs> so I just applied for export sales jobs. And, and so that dictated where I went. That got me to the Midlands, for example, where I live now, because I went to work for JCB. And I worked in export sales at JCB. And so the next few jobs that I was in was export sales or it used my languages. And then when I was made redundant later from Caterpillar, some years later, I thought, what do I do? And I actually approached a supplier and said, look, the product we've developed together is going to die unless you fund me to promote it for you. And I ended up, cut a long story short, I ended up promoting this product that was a Caterpillar product developed for another company. I traveled across Europe promoting it. And I did that for the first 14 months of my business. So that got my business up and running. But as I was doing that, I knew that wasn't going to last forever. So I thought, what else do I do? What am I good at? What do I enjoy? The martial arts that I had as a hobby came to the fore. And I thought, well, can I do something that uses my martial arts? And so I dabbled with some work there. And then I was at an exhibition, counting for business. I went around a few stand, stands and I had a little badge which said, at the name of my company, which is MW Sigma Limited. And it had little flags on it. It had a German flag, British flag and French flag, because I speak a bit of French, but very good German. And this guy saw me on the stand, he said, Duh, do you understand Six Sigma? I said, yeah, I'm a certified Six Sigma black belt. He said, oh, okay. And you speak German? I said, yeah, very good. Oh, okay. Could you go to Munich in September and deliver leadership training for us? I thought, as long as I know what I'm talking about. And I'd been through various leadership programs myself. And I looked at the syllabus and I've done most of that. I understand most of it. I'm just going to be able to relay it. And so there's a few things here I'm not familiar with. They said, ah, oh, don't worry. He said, I'm going to lead the first training in English in England you be my assistant mm-hmm. and then we'll go to Germany, you lead it and I'll be your assistant. Oh, okay. So that set me on the train of doing various bits of associate training. So it got me into leadership development and training. It got me into, I did a bit of Six Sigma here and there for other people. And I did some conflict management work, which enhanced the self-defense stuff that I'd been doing. And so I gradually built up more and more experience in that area. And that was working quite nicely. And then somebody who knows me quite well said, why don't you do havening? I'm like, what? (laughs) I've been to havering. What's havening? They said, no, it's not a place. It's a therapy. I'm not a therapist. Why why would I do that? So so the self-defense stuff that you do, which is quite in your face, literally in your face, it's very experiential. It's very challenging work. And I, just in case we talked about it, I have just a way of quickly demonstrating. She looking at. So that would be a very mild form of the experiential training that we did. And um, that is actually quite difficult for somebody who has been traumatized. And just say we pick on a subject area where they've been traumatized previously, they're not going to take long. They're just not going to do it. So I found that occasionally we'd have people in a group exercise they wouldn't be able to take part. So evening was put to me as, well, that could be a one-to-one treat. 
So I'm like, okay. I'll have a look, in, look into it. So I had a chat with the guy who was running the training, and he said, be very skeptical. He said, it sounds too good to be true, but if you think it'll work for you, come along to the training. And I spoke to somebody else who'd been his demo volunteer, and they said, oh, that's brilliant. And I trusted her, so I thought, okay. I went along for the training, blew me away. And that was 2014. So who, are, am, who am I? Coming back to your original question, long-winded way to answer it, but it's, it's all these little bits and pieces that have developed my experience and expertise. And havening has really come to the fore, particularly in the last few years, um, because of the pandemic. So right. I was quite happy doing a lot of conflict management, assertiveness, anti-bullying stuff. I was speaking in schools, doing all sorts of different work there. But that all stopped with the lockdown and COVID. I had to rebuild the business. And the business basically died overnight. So I thought, what can I do? And I could do Having Online. So I thought, okay, let's focus on that. And I became a trainer and I train therapists. I train doctors. I train all sorts of people in NLP coaches. I had an inquiry from somebody, a massage therapist last night. So people who are interested in helping people deal with the past and deal with challenges that they have, often from trauma, doesn't have to be that because it's fantastic as a coaching tool. And so that, that's what I do now. So who am I? It's all professional stuff, of course. I mean, outside of, if you want to know outside of work, I'll tell you a few bits and pieces, but from a professional point of view, that's who I am now. I've developed into a, a consultant to some extent, but also a specialist in helping people deal with nasty challenges. And that's kind of me. So for someone who's listening to this and is still maybe, you, you gave a brief description of what Havening is. So Havening is. So it's for someone who's having problems. So I'm just going to try and see if I kept it. try and describe it. For someone who's having anxiety, they're not maybe having problems coping with some things going on in their life. This can be a way that can get them through that. Would that be a good description of it? That's just part of it. Yeah, it's a good description. Havening was developed as a form of therapy, but it is so much more than that because right. If I gave you a long list of the different things that Hayden can help you with, it's all around emotion. Okay. So the, the amygdala, the bits of the brain that control our emotions, we will be familiar with fight or flight, it's the bit that runs that, if you like. Emotion is what we use to make our decisions. People think it's all about logic, it's not. Emotion is behind making our decisions to a large extent. And also, if you think about chronic pain, now I never thought I would be helping people with pain. But I am, if it's linked to trauma. Right. So it's trauma-induced, and some of the after effects of that traumatic experience is that pain is stored in the body. Right. So I've helped people with fibromyalgia, for example, on quite a few different occasions. I helped a lady not too long ago, probably about almost a year ago now, actually, who had a knot in her stomach, and just intuitively I knew it was from trauma because of some of the things she said to me. And she was somebody I knew as a, a sort of an associate. And I said to her, well, tell me to get lost if you like, but I think what you're, what's being represented in your body at the moment is trauma-based. And mm -hmm. she said, it's funny you should say that because she listed off five things that happened to her recently. And so I said, right, I'd like to help you with that. She wanted to pay me, said, actually, I'm just really intrigued if I can help you with that, that discomfort in your stomach. Yeah. Just as a case study. And she said, oh, I'm not comfortable with that. I, I want to pay you. And I said, right, okay, here's the deal. If it works, because I didn't know it was going to work or not, mm -hmm. then you come on the train course and you learn all about Haven. She said, oh, okay, I was thinking about doing that anyway, so that's fine. She came on the training course in September and she's recently certified as a practitioner herself. Cool. So it worked and it took about an hour and 40 minutes okay. until... I gave us two hours and about an hour and 40 minutes, she suddenly went, ooh, ooh, I've just felt a shift. And it actually happened as we were talking. So it's a, it, this sounds wacky, doesn't it? It sounds loopy loop, but it's true. And did she have something like fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome, something like that? She was diagnosed as having the essence of Crohn's disease. Okay. That's what it was diagnosed as. Right. She did have some physical problems, 
but actually what she was exhibiting at the time were largely taken away by what we were doing with the paper. The proof they're putting here is that not only did she come on the training course, her husband came on the training course the following month because he'd seen the change in. Right. So that was lovely. And I'm guessing that she'd been trying, like going to a GP and various other things and hadn't had any joy with any of that. Yeah, exactly that. And she actually runs a wellbeing company herself. Right. And she's died. She'd, she'd listed, and this is how I found out about it. She'd listed on her website. She'd kept a diary. And I just want to remember how she phrased it. It was uh, treating life as an experiment. That's the way she put it. And mm. she was trying, because she, she's very knowledgeable about a lot of well-being and nutrition and all sorts of things. And she had this problem. She's, I'm going to try things out every month and see if it makes any difference. And she catalogued it. Right. And some things helped a little bit, some things didn't. Right. So she was keeping this diary. And I was looking at it thinking, this is trauma. This is why it's not going away. And that's what Haveny does. It takes away the encoding that happens at the time of traumatization. It basically helps you decode what's gone on and remove it. So it's no longer there. It's just gone. Um, that's what Haven is all about. It's, a, it's based on neuroscience and it's not woo-woo. It's based on the work of an eminent neuroscientist called Dr. Ron Rudin. And he wrote a book in 2010, When the Past is Always Present, fantastic title, mm. because that's what trauma is all about. It's yeah, there to say, oh, you've had a nasty experience. If anything like this ever happens again, we just store that memory and what you did to get away from it just to keep you safe next time. Right. Which is why phobias can be incredibly unhelpful. Yeah. If something happens to you as a child that was really horrible, but actually later on in life, it has, it's of no consequence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're still held back by something that occurred to you 50 years ago, something stupid. And it's, it seems to me it's those kinds of things that you were talking about, those traumas, those phobias. They're, apart from anything else, GPs don't have sufficient time to explore into what might be the cause. Yeah. They're the things that it's just more difficult for a GP to try to help the average patient with something like that. It is. Ron, that was talking to you earlier about, Ron Rudin, was a GP for 40 years. He was okay. just retired as a GP. So he, because he was a neuroscience scientist, he always had another thing, thought at the back of his mind when he was diagnosing me. Is this a physical injury or is it up here? Right. And uh, so that's shorthand version of how that evolved. It's really interesting. Since we last spoke, something very interesting has happened. I have a colleague in New Zealand and he is a qualified doctor. He's an anaesthetist, very experienced anaesthetist. He retired from his practice a couple of years ago just to do hailing. And he is running some really interesting stuff in New Zealand at the moment, where he's trying to get funding for Haveney in the New Zealand Health Service. And there's a remarkable interview that was given recently with a young New Zealand doctor. She's recently qualified, and she stopped her practice because she said, I came to medicine to help people, right. to heal people. Yeah. And within the constraints of how I have to work, I can't do much of that. Right. I'm just prescribing pills. I'm paraphrasing. It's not exactly the word she used, but something. Mm. And so she, again, is doing havening more or less full time. Now, that's quite remarkable. Yeah. And it goes back to these nine minutes or whatever GPs have to see mm. you. Right. They are GPs. They are general practitioners. Very intelligent, very knowledgeable about lots of things, but probably not in too much detail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless they have a special, and then they send you to a consultant based on that. So, yeah, you can't complain really that they don't know everything that's out there. Yeah. But I, when I first trained in 2014, there was a doctor on the first course I went to, GP, and she was very curious about Haley. I've heard about it. And then the second time I trained, because I went back because I, I loved it, there was a different doctor there. Right. So again, open-minded GP. A lot of people feel threatened by Haley because it is so effective and so fast. But they shouldn't be because you can complement any other experience and expertise that you've got. So all sorts of modalities from NLP to CBT, which you may have heard of, EMDI, eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing, all sorts of other psychotherapy approaches, EFT, so 
tapping, people will be familiar with perhaps. So when you say some people feel threatened, are you talking about other practitioners of other sort of methods or? Yeah, be- people that use things that take years right. or, or make progress. They all have their place. They, they're all quite useful in some shape or form. Right. But actually, I know somebody who's recently qualified in CBT and they're very good at what they do and they do get great results. But I, I also know that this person is trained in Haven. They're not allowed to use Haven. Not allowed to? Okay. They're not so. allowed to. Not because it's not approved. Okay. I know that they could get results quicker using Haven. It's not to say that what they're doing is wrong. It's not wrong. Mm. It's just a different way of doing it. And combined with Haven, it's wonderful. Right. So, so, are they, so he's not allowed to combine it, then it sounds like? They are not allowed to. Okay. Yeah. And so this podcast now, so it's, you know, this series four, it's called The Art of Living Proactively. Mm-hmm. Now on the face of it, what you've described about trauma and phobias and so on is the kind of almost opposite of being proactive around health, but I'm guessing I'm wrong there. So how, what, how would you answer that? We all have challenges. Every single day we will get frustrated or annoyed or happy or, but let's just look at the slightly negative side of things, the things that we don't want to go a certain way. It's just how life is. You can't, what's the expression? You can't appreciate the sunshine until you see the rain come. So you have this light and dark, but why not be able to get back into the light really quickly? And that's what Hayden can do just to deregulate. If you get really upset from something somebody said to you, something as simple as that or you're shocked by something you've seen on the TV. Some people can get third, well, secondhand trauma, seeing stuff on TV. It's not happening to them, but they're seeing it happening on the TV. Or they've been told about it in the pub. That would be third-hand trauma. Oh, did you see that report last night? Oh, I see that dismembered limb and not great. Why not be able to take control, live life positively and proactively and use something like that to help you do it? And there's there's lots of great techniques is the one that I go to all the time. There are others and I use others, but my first port of call all the time. And so if you were, how would you define, because words can be mean different things, different people, even there may be a definition in the Oxford dictionary or whatever, but we can all have our own interpretation of things. How would you define being proactive around health? I think it's taking responsibility. For your own health. Right. We've had conversations about fitness, for example, and you can choose to do something different with your time. You can choose to sit in front of the TV, have a bag of crisps and a pint of beer, or you can choose to do something else, which is a bit more active, whether you talk about heart rate or whether you're talking about up here reading a book or not all TV's bad. But from it but it's uh, you, you can make choices it's do you eat a carrot or a cream cake sometimes it's hard to make the right decision because both of those are quite long but it's about taking control and and havening it allows you to take control because you're not controlled by something else and you likened it there to physical or to, to fitness and i remember you saying something before about emotional health is as important as physical health yeah can yeah. you elaborate on that I, I don't claim to know all the studies around this, but I'm, I know there are studies that prove that looking after your emotional health is, is very important. I, I can only speak for myself. When I, and people that I've helped, where if you look after your emotional well-being, then you can cope with, you can cope with anything that comes your way, even, even the most horrible things. I'll, I'll give you an example. There's a chap, he approached me the other day, He's just lost his wife to a, a really horrible disease. He's got a brain condition and he could choose to just roll up and just not participate. Mm. But he reached out and he said, look, I'm stricken with grief because not only have I lost the love of my life, but traumatic the way she passed away. I was caring for her at home by herself and he can't sleep and he doesn't have any appetite and he's just 
and it's triggered things that happened in his past. So he's made a decision to do something about it. Right. And he's offered to be a volunteer in one of my demonstration events. And I've said that the one I'm doing tomorrow, for example, which is an open event, it's not appropriate. It wouldn't be fair on him or be a great demo for me, to be honest, um, because it just doesn't fit with what I was trying to do. And, but I have said to him, he, he's a self-havening guide. I've actually sent him a self-havening guide a couple of days ago. And he's come back saying, oh, that's been really helpful. Thank you. And that's just a piece of paper going through an eight-step process that I developed mm -hmm. to help people in the moment deal with very uncomfortable situations. Right. So it's not going to take away the root cause, which is what I can do with Hayley. But I said to him at one of my training events, I've got a training event happening in recording this in. We're still just in May, aren't we? Don't Very much too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but in June 2023, when doing a course, I said to him, would you like to be my demonstration volunteer? Where I could spend longer with you and I can use lots of different types of to demonstrate to my trainees mm. how you apply different types of so that they'll have trained with me, learned all the techniques, and then this is how you put it together. Right. So he's thinking about whether he wants to do that. That would be appropriate. So I can definitely help him. But he's made the decision, I'm going to do something about it. I'm not going to sit here and wallow in my own self-pity, which he's got plenty to think about. That's reminding me of, I, 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 I've got a feeling we may have spoke about this before, the book Victor Frankl, Man's, Man's Search for Meaning. Yeah. yeah. It's on a very different degree, but it reminds me of his approach to his situation inside the concentration camps. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't heard of that book until about two years ago, three years ago, maybe. And uh, oh, so, and I, so I read it, I can't remember too much about it, but I do remember the principal thing. Basically, life happens, it's what you do with it, eventually after that, that, that makes the difference. And we can all make a difference. We can all choose yeah. to at least try to be happier or try to do something about what's happened to us. Or we can just wallow in it and let it happen to us. And the full title of this, so the tagline to this podcast says, it's the art of living proactively, but the tagline is harnessing the power of your choices. Oh, okay. Yeah. There you go. That fits perfectly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. You choose to live with it or you do something about it. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, I so see you talked about how you're helping people with, with trauma and phobia and so on. So say someone has had traumatic episode or episodes in their life, you help them deal with that. And is it a case of then, because as you say, that it doesn't mean that the trauma doesn't exist for them anymore. It's still going to be in their memory somewhere. And it could be a situation in the future where, for some reason, that memory starts to come back and starts to get a bit tra traumatic for them. You've given them some kind of a coping technique they can easily dispel it. Is it something like that? Okay, but it's a couple of things there. Generally, you won't forget what happened to you. So something awful happened. You won't forget that happened. It's our emotional link to that that changes. Right. And also other ways we perceive it. So all, when we think about cognitively how we think about it. Oh, that happened because of the relationship that I was going through at the time, or my parents were trying to protect me, or it would have been an accident if we hadn't had done this. So there's, they understand the reason for it, but cognitive reasoning. Right. The autonomic relationship to it, having to breathe really fast, or right. getting embarrassed, flushed, or shaky, or some other sense on your body, the chronic pain we talked about, or shape or something like that, that will can potentially disappear as well, and probably will if we work all the way through the issue. But the emotion will go. So we always talk about subjective unit stress score. So 10 is really horrendous, zero means nothing to you. And ideally, I'd like to get people to zero. And so they look at it and go, yeah, that happened to me, but something's happened in the past. And that's exactly what this always comes to mind when I talk about this sort of thing. There's a lady I worked with probably four years ago, five years ago, maybe. She was sexually assaulted 38 years previous to me meeting her. And I was organizing a self-defense course when I was talking about earlier. And she arrived early and I said, oh, Katie, what made you come on to the self-defense course? And she burst out crying. Uh, oh, and I apologize. I said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. And she started to tell me in graphic detail without prompting, sexual assault happened all that time ago. I said, look, you don't have to tell me anything. We can't do anything now. 
because mm-hmm. you know people are coming going to come through the door any moment now on the, we're doing the course but if you have time next week after the course if you'll allow me to i think i can help you this is okay so she came back the following week sat her down and it took 15 minutes to get rid of the, the issue because there's a one-off which is fantastic and her comment her actual words at the end were it just happened so from being crying really upset and for understandable reasons she was frightened of going out at night in the dark right. you know didn't like it when people and it sounds like she had been for the last 38 years yes right yeah. and so she she was now in the situation where it's gone it had no emotional resonance for her whatsoever and i asked her to think back to the time that it happened and she thought about it no oh, it just happened right and i'm like yes right and she and she then reached for a handbag to get me get some money to pay me and this is one of the loveliest things i said you don't need to do it she said what do you mean i said well, you've paid for the self defense course this was my and it was my absolute pleasure right. to help with that it was just it just happened to be right place right time and uh, i said you've already paid for the course yeah. that's more than enough payment seeing the smile on your face it's fantastic and that's what people feel like afterwards just, just whereas i said you give them coping techniques should it come again it doesn't come again because they're thinking no. about it differently no it's not to say it can't be re-traumat uh, you can't be traumatized by something else right what could get re-traumatized in the exact same way but there could be something similar who knows i'll give you another similar type of thing there's a lady who i helped who worked as a she worked in a buffet car with a trolley on the train walk up and down the train selling food and drink and she was sexually assaulted unfortunately on the train by passengers and cut long story short she went back to work which she wasn't going to do after the hater it did it's not to say that she couldn't be attacked again and have some kind of a horrible traumatization again that's possible but it would be a fresh thing that happened and we would approach it in a different way looking at all the circumstances around that situation right. what it would what we did was in between we did certain notes and self defense training to make sure it never got to that point again right so that's trying to make sure she was exposed to that cuz you you mentioned in the beginning that when you were talking about like when i asked you who are you and you mentioned that sig cuz it's sigma it sounded like i was thinking of zig 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 zigler yeah zig zigler <laughs> yeah six sigma is it's a methodology used in quality and when i worked at catfish i was a product manager originally then i was asked if i'd like to be a commercial black belt i'm like well, i'm nearly a nearly a black belt in karate what are you on about and they said no no this is six sigma and it's a methodology of running a project and it's all through excellence in process so it's a quality thing so that's six, and six sigma is 3.4 defects per million opportunities that's your official definition yeah so i can be very detail focused but i'm also quite creative and uh, so they wanted a commercial somebody with a commercial background to work on commercial projects normally they would have engineers manufacturing specialists working on these projects and previously they'd be shop floor manufacturing engineering issues and i had a couple of those but i also had some marketing issues like our friends in america designed this fantastic new machine but neglected to look at certain markets in europe where sales were going to nose dive because they hadn't done that so we came up with some creative solutions to not losing all this market share that'd been built up over decades so i've misunderstood then i thought you were referring to sick this sick six sigma as something to do with martial arts or self defense but it's not unnatural that you're confused by it because they use terminology belt terminology so a black belt is the project manager oh okay and i had a master black belt who trained me for example and, uh, and when you're on a, a group a team in six sigma you often have green belts green belts are they're partially qualified in six sigma you have subject matter experts you have white belts you have yellow belts it's basically to say it's a very strict process that you follow 
and you do not pass go, you do not pass a gateway until you've done certain things. Right. So it could, it can be very interesting. It can be dull as dishwater as well. So it just depends on the project you do. <laughs> right. So how does using Haven techniques, and clearly you've mentioned how you've, you, you get other people to become instructors as well. So you'll expand the, the amount well, of people. Practitioners. I know. And so I can see how it's going to help them and maybe give them a new business and so on. And does it, is it going to help them in, I guess it's going to help them in sort of personal growth as well. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I use it not every day, if I'm honest, but I use it most days right. just to keep myself down regulated. If I have an argument with somebody, which these things happen right. just to bring myself down. I had a, I won't go into the detail, but I had a very nasty commercial experience last year in October. And A, I was very angry, but secondly, I was just, I couldn't believe it happened. And they respected this person initially, thought they were quite capable and I was looking to work with them, but they turned out to be a very nasty person and I found it quite upsetting. So I did a lot of havening on myself just to get rid of the emotion. Right. And uh, yeah, I was shouting a lot of expletives in the shower whilst I was doing a bit of self havening. Yeah, I won't share those here. <laughs> and so is it, are most of the people who come to learn this in order to be able to teach it to other people, uh, I'm wondering, are they doing it in combination with other things they do? Is it just something some of them just want to have as a skill or do many of them just use it as their main job as such? Just thinking about the people that I trained, probably about half or they have a background in either therapy or some kind of, yeah, therapy primarily. And the other half are almost half are in some kind of coaching environment. There's been a couple that have joined me for personal reasons. There's one guy in, based in Spain who wanted to help members of his family, but most are coming along to do certification. As in, they, they do 30 case studies, they do two video studies, they do an exam in Havening, and I support them for at least a year doing that. And if they need it for a year, that is. And so they come from really wide backgrounds. I've had some very experienced academics, as well as a nurse in Denmark, all sorts of tapping specialists, psychotherapists. In fact, I have some, some psychotherapists that recommend me for certain aspects. And one of them said, you just make my work a lot faster. Right. <laughs> so it, it, it can fit with all sorts of things. I don't have, as, it, as I've outlined earlier, I'm not dyed in the wall, experienced psychotherapist. I don't claim to be. And I use Having virtually standalone as a tool. And that's why it can be threatened to some people because they will, how can somebody just off the street do I'm not off the street. I do have quite a bit of experience of trauma. It's what it's wise to get involved and do your time learning about trauma, in particular if you want to use it in the trauma environment. But actually, I've met some very talented people who are brilliant at helping people with trauma who don't have that experience. It's interesting you said that because I was just thinking about if someone was interested in learning more about this to have as a, maybe as a tool in their toolbox, mm -hmm. but they hadn't encountered any trauma in their lives or phobias or anything, would it still, would it, would they still be able to appreciate, I don't know, would, do you ever get any people like that? Yeah. We talk a lot about compassion. If you're a compassionate person and you want mm. to help people, then Haven is wonderful for that. A lot of people talk about empathy. You've got to have empathy for people and empathy can be really useful, but actually when you're a therapist, if you get too empathetic and you feel what other people are feeling, that's not always good for you. Right. And you can feel how they've, the suffering they're going through. If you can take yourself to one side, not to be unconcerned right. or cold, but to yeah. be a bit more dispassionate and compassionate. Right. That's a far better place, I think. And so you could argue, I don't argue necessarily, but you could argue that somebody who's experienced trauma might not always be the best person to help somebody. 
Right. Where, you know, somebody who understands what how trauma is encoded, how you support people professionally in a safe environment, and understand the neuroscience of how to decode that encoding mm. and enable them to be the best that they can be in whatever they want to do. Maybe they're a better person. Right. To help somebody. And and equally there are people who've experienced trauma and it drives them into wanting to help other people. And that, there's plenty of fantastic people out there doing that sort. Yeah. And um, you don't have to look therapist into Google or something and you'll find thousands of them around the world who've had experienced trauma and they are brilliant. So I think both work, actually. So is Haven in pretty global now, or is it more certain countries? It's certainly more certain countries. When I looked into this a few years ago, there were, at the time, there were about 400 practitioners in the UK, and there were about 400 in the US. Oh. And apart from that, there was other English speaking areas around the world. So Australia, New Zealand, Canada, they were sort of, they were the cornerstone of, of Havening. Right. But there are certain pockets around Scandinavia, around Italy, and they evolved over time, but now it's much, much more widespread. Right. Largely because of the COVID, right. because it all used to be face to place training. So you'd have somebody travel somewhere do some training and then leave behind them a whole load of practitioners and let it spread from there. Right. But now what you've got is people, you know, I've like, trained people in Israel, I've mentioned Denmark, lots of people in the States, Canada, further afield, uh, Germany, uh, various other parts of Europe. But I have people on my intros, somebody's just inquired from Thailand, I had communication with something in New Zealand this morning. I've had people in, somebody coming tomorrow from Mexico, various different countries in South America. I've had a few people from South Africa, from Zambia, Middle East, I had somebody from Oman recently. Um, so to answer your question, it's slowly getting there, but the numbers are quite small right. in certain countries. So I think still in China, there's only about three practitioners and they're all in Hong Kong, I think. So that's hugely dis doesn't show what opportunity there is by anyway, mm. or, or coverage there is. Yeah, so it took a long time to answer that question, sorry. <laughs> so if people are listening to this and they're thinking, yeah, that sounds like something that would be useful for me, how would they go about it? Would they just go to your website and what would they do? I'd recommend coming on to an intro. Okay. And I'm doing funny enough tomorrow night. And you can get to was on Eventbrite. I run one at least every month during the year. And it's very easy to put into Google now. It's well, into a search engine, even web browser, whatever you call it. HTTPS colon two forward slash and then bit bit dot ly and then forward slash havening intros. And it'll get you there. And don't worry if you didn't catch that, it'll be in the show notes. If you didn't catch that URL. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I run those regularly, but that's probably the best thing. And what in that is within an hour, you'll get a bit of the background about Havening, where it came from, a little bit about the neuroscience. You'll see a live demonstration of somebody who comes along with one issue. So we only present what's called event Havening in these sessions. And they will get immediate relief from whatever they're suffering from. And then at the end, everybody has a go to self Havening. And they learn how to self haven. So I, I described the haven touch, which is can be as I'm doing here on the video. So the shoulders down, the arms, to the elbows back up again. Very nice soothing feeling all around the face, palms of the hands. That generates something called a delta wave. I explain why that's critical to havening in the in that house session. And actually what happens, so we stop the signal being sent further that would say, oh, you need to feel pain now, or, oh, you need to feel uncomfortable. You need to run away. You need to do this. We stop that signal being sent any further so that you're back to where you were before the traumatization. Um, yeah, so that, that's the best way of accessing. Or if somebody doesn't want to listen through to an hour of me yakking away, and then I do offer to people 15 minute tryout. 
Okay. The reason I do that is because I know I can get an effect within 15 minutes. Right. And but I can't offer that all the time because I that's free of charge. Right. And can't do that forever. I can't do an hour one of those because I won't make enough money to live. Yeah, and yeah. they'll get too many people who want it to do it. So that's why the, you know, some people prefer a group thing as well. Even though you don't have to talk about anything within Haven if you don't wish to. Now, I'm wondering if when you were describing that, if do you get situations where, say, for example, someone has been traumatized so badly, they really don't feel they don't want to talk about it to people they don't know. Yeah. And so maybe a family member learns it so the family member can help that person because they obviously trust the family member. Did, has there been situations like that, for example? I've never had that so far. What I have had is I've had some children that have come to me with their parents. And I always give people the choice. If it's in person, I give people a choice. So if you would like me to, and you give me permission, then I'll apply the havening touch on your arms and shoulders, face or hands. If you don't feel comfortable with that, or you just wish to do it yourself, then you can self-apply and I teach them how to do it. Occasionally, the parent will apply it. Right. It depends on the ratio. Some, quite often I want to keep the parent out of the room, to be honest because sometimes it's to do with the parent. Right. And if they want to talk to me about the situation, then they'll feel inhibited from do, doing so potentially because they're in the room. Right. So I've had that situation where the parent applies hating touch, but I've never had somebody saying, oh no, I don't want to talk to somebody, so I'm going to get remember, the family trained up to do it with me. If my experience is anything to go by, I've been trying to apply havening to one of my daughters for about a year. And she's finally actually applying some self hate herself. And she's saying, Oh, it's making a difference, Dad. Mm. But it's taken a long time for her to actually access that. Even though I've been hopefully gently dropping it into conversation every now and then. Um yeah, some people having having close member of the family isn't always the right thing actually. Okay. Because there's a connection. Maybe they're part of the shared history. Maybe they're part of the problem. No. We're, we're flying through time here. So I'm going to test your memory now, Mark. And okay. You don't necessarily need to use your memory here because you could just change your mind. So <laughs> last time we spoke, I asked you, was there a book that really moved you for any reason? So do you want to try and remember what that was? Or are you just going to give me a, something else, that, a book? It doesn't have to be related to what you do. It could be... Just a book that has moved you for some reason in your life. The Gift of Fear. And I'm just trying to remember the author's name. I can't think of the author's name. The we could, I'll put that in the show notes, but what, why was that impactful? I heard about it when I was doing my, a, a particular type of martial arts piece of work. And somebody on the course, they said, oh, have you come across this book? And I said, oh, no, don't know what that is. I said, oh, I really recommend reading. And it was all about sharpening your awareness. And that actually being frightened is a really helpful thing if you utilize it effectively. And actually, that, that feeds nicely into hate because that's exactly what this encoding is all about. It's right. supposed to be helpful. It's your amygdala being absolutely logical. That was really horrible. 20 years ago or two minutes ago, whatever it was, you don't want to do this, go off and do that. Right. And it's fear that drives it. It's fear of some kind of loss, whether it's a loss of your life or liberty or friendship or something else. But it's all about fear of losing something. You mentioned before about the monthly webinar you do. Is there, if people want to contact, connect with you on, say, social media or LinkedIn, are they able to do that? They are indeed. And uh, if you look Mark Wingfield up on LinkedIn, you'll find me easily enough. I've got a, an Instagram channel, which is Max Train Develop, and the scores between the words. And Facebook, I think I'm just Mark Wingfield on Facebook. And there's Max Conflict Management on Facebook as well, which is, again, comes from the self-defense side. Okay. So thank you, yeah. And to finish, Mark, is there a quote that you particularly like? There's loads of quotes I really like. It's what I can't be today, I can be tomorrow. Okay. And why is that? 
because you can't. You don't have to stay where you are right now. It's bad choices that we talked about earlier. If you want to, if you want to do something different, do it. But you have to make a start. Mark, it's been a pleasure. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Tony. And I'll speak to you soon. Yeah, look forward to it. Thanks so much. Take care. Next week is episode 228 with Luke Watts, who is the founder and CEO of The Cancer Coach, who are revolutionizing cancer care and chronic illness management through his groundbreaking initiative. By combining evidence-based lifestyle medicine with a deep understanding of behavioral changes. So Luke and his team have created an international network of qualified health coaches dedicated to supporting individuals with cancer. And his recent achievement, which is called the Tree of Life program, developed in collaboration with experts in oncology and behavioral sciences, empowers individuals by providing immediate and long lasting effects in cancer prevention, survivorship and caregiving support. So that's, that's next week's episode with Luke Watts. We're going to hear a lot more about exactly what is the Cancer Coach, how it works, more about the tree of life and how that's going to help many people and the educational aspect of it as well. So that's episode 228 with Luke Watts. That's next week. <laughs>